Good morning, welcome. Um, my name's Matthew Hilton. I'm the CEO of the Advocacy People. Um, we've invited you to join us today so that we can explain a little bit about how advocacy can help to improve the lives of people who live in and people who work in care homes. While we've aimed this webinar at care homes in Kent, the same principles, of course, apply to all care homes across England. So uh, thanks for joining us today or via the recording, if that's the way you're, you're accessing this. And we hope that you find the information you get today useful and we certainly welcome your feedback on it. We plan for this session to last around 30 minutes. Uh, it is being recorded, so if you can't stay for the whole time, you'll be able to catch up later. If you're joining live and you have questions, please do use the, uh, the Q&A um, function. And for general comments, the chat function is up too. If you don't want all other attendees to see your comments and questions, you can, of course, set it to private, which means it'll only be seen by the team here. Uh, if you've got a question that requires a more extensive response, then we can give you immediately. Or if we don't have time to answer all the questions, we'll get back to you in the next few days. Uh, uh, and if you're watching the recording, just please do call or, or email us. Um, what we're hoping is that by, uh, by the end of this webinar, uh, you'll know who we are and what advocacy is, that you'll understand the different types of advocacy and understand how advocacy can support your residents and you in your work. Um, so before we get into the main presentation, just a little bit from me about us and about advocacy. Um, so we are the advocacy people. We were previously called CAP, um, and we're a, a, an, ad, an independent charity based across the south of England, providing free and independent advocacy. In Kent, we provide all the adult advocacy services that local authority has to commission. And today we're going to focus on two of those services, but you can find out more about our other services, of course, on our website. Um, advocacy can be quite hard to understand and it's often um, confused with the legal term of the same name. But put simply, our advocates provide um, an, uh, an independent voice for the person, for the client, obtaining and passing on their views when decisions are being made about them. We make sure that their rights are being upheld and that proper processes are being followed particularly when the person lacks capacity or confidence to speak up for themselves. I think we all know, don't we, how hard it can be when we don't feel listened to, when what's important to us isn't taken seriously by others, or we don't have the words to say what we really feel or want. And it can be even more difficult when decisions are being made about our health and our social welfare. And of course, many of the people you're working with don't have the capacity to engage fully in the decision-making process. So by engaging with a person, with a client, as far as possible, and speaking to the people around them as appropriate, we try to build up a picture of the person's needs, wishes, and views, and communicate those to the decision makers. And what sets us apart from the other people involved in health and social care is our independence. We don't make decisions. We aren't emotionally involved. We don't deliver care. And all that means that we can remain objective and person-centered. Okay, um, we got no vested interest other to ensure that the person's voice is heard and their rights are upheld within the relevant frameworks. So in this webinar, um, we're gonna focus on the role of independent mental capacity advocates, IMCARs, and relevant persons representatives under the deprivation of liberty safeguards, IMCARs under the Mental Capacity Act, and Independent Care Act advocates under the Care Act 2014. So um, just now introduce our two presenters. Um, so we have, uh, first of all, Lauren Fernandez, uh, who is an independent mental capacity advocate from our Kent team. Hello, good morning. Great. And also Nikki Ryder, who's another of our advocates from the Kent team. Good morning. Hi, hi both. And um, both uh, colleagues are here to share their expertise with you so you can understand how advocacy can help. Um, so first, I think we're gonna go over to Lauren just to explain a bit more about why we're doing this webinar and what we hope to achieve. Lauren. Thanks very much, Matthew. And good morning, everyone. So the reason really for us holding this session came from a discussion that we were just having in the Kent team. Um, us advocates were traveling all over the county, visiting people in all kinds of different situations. 
but a large proportion of our clients are in care homes or in services that you guys are working in. Um, and there are places that I've driven past and wondered, why have I never been in there? A lot of my colleagues agreed. Um, there are people and care homes that are simply not accessing advocacy. And the reasons for this aren't really clear. It could be that these care homes and staff don't know what advocacy is or who should access it, or maybe they don't feel it's their responsibility to request an advocate. So the aim of this session is to give you some confidence to be able to ask, why doesn't this resident have an advocate? Should they have one? And if so, how do we get them one? The question that comes up in care homes that we do go in regularly is why did you come and see this person but not that one? So hopefully we can cover that as well today. Right, that is great. Thank you, Lauren. Um, I think it's also worth noting, isn't it, at this point uh, that we obviously can't work in the way you normally would because of the COVID situation, visiting residents in care homes is pretty difficult. But that doesn't mean, does it, that the need for advocacy has in any way diminished and we, we continue to do all we can to continue to advocate for people? Absolutely, yes. So since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, as an organisation, we have had just over 2,400 referrals for people just in care homes. Um, 950 of those are in Kent. Last year, in the same period, we had around 1,200 referrals in Kent. We are contacting clients by phone, we're doing video calls, there is always a way that we can connect with clients and ensure their voices are heard. So Nikki and I were chatting the other day about um, a client that she managed to go and see and she actually met them in, in the client's garden. So this was all agreed with the professionals that were involved, it was a very urgent situation and a thorough risk assessment took place before that was all agreed. Great. Okay. Right. So let's get going on the presentation then. Um, remember, um, if you're active on social media, please do tag us um, at Advocacy People and use the hashtag Advocacy Helps. And of course, please do um, use the um, Q&A function to ask your questions as we go through. Right. So Lauren, I think we're going to go back to you now for the presentation. Excellent, thank you. And thanks to everyone for joining us today. Some of you were sort of personally invited to watch. Some of you might be watching it on a recording. Maybe you're sharing it in your team meeting. That's a really good idea. Um, it doesn't really matter. You're all very welcome and we just hope that you find it useful. So it's gonna be a bit of a whistle stop tour through the different types of advocacy that you're most likely to have contact with in your services. So we're going to aim to answer some of the questions that I mentioned before, and we're going to give you some key pieces of information about advocacy so that you can get the best for your residents, really. We're going to start with the deprivation of liberty safeguards, known as DOLs. You might be aware that this legislation is due to change from April 2022. DOLs is going to be replaced by the Liberty Protection Safeguards, LPS. But until that time, DOLs continues. That's what we're going to focus on today. DOLS is a legal authorization required by a care home or hospital to deprive a person of their liberty if they are deemed to lack capacity to understand and consent to the care arrangements that mean that they are not free to leave and are under continuous supervision. These safeguards can be in place when supporting people with dementia, learning disabilities, mental health problems or any other condition really which means that the person is not able to provide their consent to those arrangements. A good example is a person living in a locked care home, only able to go out of that home if they're accompanied by a member of staff, because without that support, they would be in danger, potentially very vulnerable. The issue of a person's capacity is a whole other topic, and we're not really going to touch on that today, just to say here that an IMCA, an independent mental capacity advocate, does not get involved in a capacity assessment. Often the A in IMCA is misunderstood and thought to mean assessor. So if you have a resident in your care who doesn't have a DOLS authorization in place, but you think that they should have one, you should notify the DOLS office at KCC or whichever local authority that person is an ordinary resident of. And that's normally the local authority that are paying for the placement. So as part of the authorization process, a best interests assessor or a BIA, and that's usually a qualified social worker, 
will undertake an assessment and coordinate input from other relevant people, including a mental health assessor. They would also usually aim to speak to a family member or a friend of the individual. However, we know that not everyone has someone who can do this. In this situation, the Dole's office will instruct an IMCA, an independent mental capacity advocate, for a one-off engagement with that person. You, care home staff, can play a key role in identifying who could or should be contacted or recommending that an IMCA is instructed. So once a DOLS has been authorised, this is called a standard authorisation. The law states that every single person who is under a standard authorisation must have a representative. This person is called the relevant person's representative or the RPR. Again, it's usually a family member or a friend, someone who is able to contact the person regularly. Ideally, and in usual circumstances, that would be face to face. It is that person's job to make sure that the current care arrangements continue to be in the person's best interest. If the person doesn't have any family or friends who can fulfill that role, then the local authority Dole's team must arrange for an advocate to do it. This is then called a paid RPR. Even if a person does have regular contact with a family or a friend, the best interest assessor still may determine that they are not a suitable person to represent that person objectively. This might be due to their own views or just their availability. Some family members actually prefer for an independent person to take on this role. So this is why you will see some of us coming to see a resident and not other residents. But everyone subject to a DOLS authorization must have an RPR who visits or at least phones if they can't visit, usually every six to eight weeks. If you don't see or hear from the RPR for a couple of months, whether that's a paid person or not, and you can check that on the authorization paperwork, you need to be letting the Dole's office know because this means that the legal duty isn't being upheld. Now, of course, with COVID-19 at the moment, we can't make face-to-face -face visits. Um, but as I said before, we're still contacting our clients and care homes in many other ways, and we're still able to fulfill that role. So you should still expect the same level of contact. So Nikki and I, we both work as paid RPRs. Part of our job is to be a voice, uh, uh, excuse me, is to be a voice for the person, to ask questions, to alert the doll's office or, or care management teams of concerns or changes. In order for us to gather the key information, we might ask you for info from the care plan, anything that is relevant evidence to ensure that the care plan continues to be person centred. The RPR role is very much there to ensure a person's needs are being met and that the dolls remains appropriate, proportionate, and in the person's best interest. This type of advocacy is an ongoing role. It lasts for the length of the dolls authorization, which is often a year, hence why you would expect to see or hear from the RPR regularly. The RPR must take seriously any objections that the person is making to their living arrangements and take this forward on their behalf. This might be in the form of asking for a doll's review or even taking the case to the court of protection. It is worth remembering that even if all others involved believe that the restrictions in place are in the best interests of that person, the client themselves may well still disagree and they have the right to be heard. For further clarity and a bit more information about that, you can look at the cases of P versus Cheshire West Council and also the case of RD and others. So advocacy is always what we call issue specific. So the allocated advocate can only support a person with the one issue that they've been instructed for. There is sometimes a misconception that because we're involved in supporting a person, we are their advocate indefinitely for all matters. That's not the case. So an RPR would only be able to represent the client for issues relating to doles and restrictions. But that is not to say that another advocate can't help. We just need a new referral. Thank you, Lauren. Um, so if I understand it correctly, 
it's the role of the doll's office to instruct the RPR, but the care home has an important role to play in that they've got to identify those residents who may need a doll's authorization. And then once the authorization is in place, make sure that the RPR is in contact. Yes, that's right. So the RPR's contact details should be added to the resident's file because they are now a key person. The care home should notify the RPR of any significant changes in that resident's care. They don't need to wait for contact from the RPR to tell them about something that's important. Great, thank you. So that's uh, that touches then on the role of the IMCAR under dolls. And we, we said that IMCARs also play an important role when particular decisions are being made under the Mental Capacity Act. So I think back to you, Lauren, to talk a bit about that as well now. So an IMCAR, an Independent Mental Capacity Advocate, that can be requested by an authorised person, usually an NHS body or a local authority caseworker. Um, an IMCAR can be requested to support an individual when a decision is being made. Under the Mental Capacity Act, an IMCAR must be instructed when a person has been assessed as lacking capacity to make a specific decision at the current time. There also has to be no family member or friend appropriate, willing and able to be consulted. And the decision is about either of these things. A change of accommodation decision, for example, a care home is no longer able to meet a person's need. Um, or providing, withholding or stopping serious medical treatment. Examples of serious medical treatment as defined in the MCA would be treatment for cancer, surgery, artificial nutrition and hydration. I do just want to mention here um, DNAR notices. Um, do not resuscitate, do not attempt resuscitation um, notices. There have been human rights concerns raised about the blanket issuing of these notices by GPs. To be clear, this is classed as a serious medical decision under the MCA and therefore if one is being considered, the same eligibility for an IMCA applies as to any other serious medical treatment decision. So if a GP is making a decision and um, the resident doesn't have any family or friends, anyone um, that's able to um, support them with this decision and they're not able to consent to this, then you need to be letting the GP know that an IMCA is needed to make sure that this decision is compliant with the MCA. The MCA, the Mental Capacity Act, also says that an IMCA may be instructed for care reviews and safeguarding alerts. However, these requirements have been largely superseded by the CARE Act, which I think we're going to talk about shortly. So, what does an IMCA do? The IMCA will work with the client to ensure that the person is placed at the centre of the best interest decision and that the process set out by the Mental Capacity Act is followed. We do this by spending time with the person, by accessing any relevant documents, by speaking to key people, by attending meetings on behalf of the individual. The IMCA can challenge a decision that's been made if they believe that the client would want them to. They could do this by asking for a second medical opinion. This then puts the person in the same position as someone who has capacity. We all have the right to request a second opinion. Ultimately, the decision maker still has a best interest decision to make, but if the IMCA doesn't support that decision, that is as powerful as the individual themselves objecting. And this can mean that the case is referred to the court protection, um, just like in the case of East Lancashire Hospital Trust versus PW, that was in 2019. This case, it highlighted really the importance of IMCA referrals being made in good time so that um, a person's views and wishes can be fully explored. Basically, the decision maker must consider any matters that an IMCA raises. So again, if you think an IMCA should be instructed, speak with the decision maker. Right, Lauren, thank you very much. Um, so basically, um, what we've learned there is that if a decision is being made about a resident, that could mean where they live will change, or that serious medical treatment's being considered, one of the things that always needs to be checked is whether an IMCAR should be instructed. 
That's right. Um, the Mental Capacity Act Code of Practice sets it all out um, in Chapter 10. Great. Thank you very much. Right. The next section then is going to focus on Independent Care Act advocacy. And I'm going to hand over to Nikki for this one. And please, if you're uh, asking questions, do keep them coming. So, Nikki, over to you. Thank you, Matthew. So now, whereas the Independent Mental Capacity Act role is based around particular decisions, advocacy under the CARE Act, that's our Independent Care Act advocates, is focused more on the process. For yourselves working in care homes, these are most likely to be adult needs assessments, um, preparation of a care and support plan, review of a care and support plan, or even a safeguard and alert. It's important to note that advocacy involvement on these last two were optional under the Mental Capacity Act, but now have been made mandatory under the CARE Act and are subject to specific criteria being met. So what we've talked about so far under the Deprivation of Liberties and the Mental Capacity Act are both for people who have been assessed as lacking capacity. Whereas the criteria for a Care Act advocate is that the person has substantial difficulty in being fully involved in the process. So there is no set assessment for this, rather it falls to the social worker or care manager to make this judgment. The person must also not have anyone appropriate or able to support them. The advocate will need to be instructed by the care manager or social worker team. Um, so again, if you feel this resident is going through one of these processes and should be referred to an advocate, ask if this can be done. And if not, ask why not. Um, an Care Act advocate supports the person to understand their rights in making decisions about care and treatment, communicating their views and wishes, and can challenge decisions and processes. They will do this by consulting the person um, and others involved, as well as reviewing care records. In a safeguard and alert, the advocate will help the person understand the safeguard and concern and decide what outcomes and changes they want, understand what actions they need to take to safeguard themselves and understand what support they can expect from others. One of our advocates recently supported a client to challenge the decision that their direct payments were stopped. The advocate's involvement meant the client was able to understand the process for making a formal challenge and this resulted in the payments being reinstated at a lower level. Now, during this time, the client's self health actually um, deteriorated as well. So the advocate supported the person to formally challenge this again. And this led to them eventually being offered an increase in hours and they now get adequate support. Um, another Care Act advocate recently supported a client in a care home to move on to a placement of their own with a supported living provider, something that the client stated they'd wanted for many years. Okay, so I think we now understand, we can see the difference between the types of advocacy and how it provides a crucial independent voice and I hope oversight of care for people who find it difficult to speak up for themselves. I think what we've also learned there is that while you as care home staff may not be able to make a referral yourselves, you do play a crucial role in asking the questions of those who should be referring. Is that, is that right, Lauren? Yeah, that is right. And if you're not sure, give us a call. We're always happy to chat through um, and we can we can look through anonymous situations without opening up a referral yet. Uh, OK, that's great. Thank you. And Nikki, perhaps uh, a final point from you. Could you perhaps say a word about how you think advocacy can specifically help the audience today, the people who are working day in, day out in the care homes? Yes, indeed. Um, we're here to help you. Advocacy can take off some of the weight from your shoulders. We can make sure that your most vulnerable clients are at the centre of their care planning. And we can also support you as a service. Care staff are regularly advocating for individuals in their care on a day-to-day -day basis. But professional advocate can strengthen that voice, promote good practice. An advocacy presence could result in the individual's needs being meta assessed quicker. It can also speed up hospital discharges and make sure the decisions are made on behalf of your resident in line with current legislation. So in short, it's good practice and good practice means good service. Thank you 
Lauren and Nikki both for presenting today. Uh, thanks to everyone uh, who's joined us. Um, I do hope uh, that the information uh, provided today has uh, helped you to understand a bit how advocacy can um, uh, help improve things in care homes and how you can access the advocacy. Do take a look at our website, follow us on social media. And if you do think of any more questions or if you have a resident you'd like to discuss, then please do get in touch. Um, and um, thanks again, everyone. Uh, and have a really great day. Bye-bye.